the Sackler Colloquia on the Science of Science Communication, where scientists and communication professionals come together to write a better future for communicating science. Good morning. My name is Ralph Cicerone. I'm the president of the National Academy of Sciences, and it's really a pleasure to welcome such an active group. It's really very stimulating. I want to thank several people who've helped us to uh, gather the resources and have provided all kinds of support for the planning and the meeting itself. Certainly, Jillian Sackler, whose late husband, Dr. Arthur Sackler, provided some funds for us to convene all kinds of meetings on many fields of science aimed at bringing people together who often don't work together, who have much to learn from each other, so this meeting certainly fits that bill. We also have some support for this event from the National Science Foundation, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, Compass, uh, Science Magazine, and members of our own president circle who are very interested in these topics. The proceedings, proceedings yesterday, today, and tomorrow are certainly built on the enthusiasm uh, that many of us have, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to foster this kind of collaboration, to learn from each other and see what we can teach each other and to gather from different people's experiences. My own commitment and interest in communication about science has been getting deeper over the years. When I came here as president, I already felt that it had to be a very high priority. Uh, and although I'm in a field, and all of my previous research has been in atmospheric chemistry and climate change, I, that field has been characterized by all kinds of challenges with communication. Nonetheless, I think we have a broader challenge, and I think we should have broader goals than just about our own individual field. For example, wouldn't it be nice if we could help to create, in a small way, uh, a much broader interest in developing a scientific frame of mind where people in their daily lives would acquire and evaluate data and consider it as they make decisions or, or decide to hang back whatever. So that's one of our ultimate goals. But more immediately, a few years ago, uh, my colleagues and I here at the National Academy of Sciences were getting more concerned by the public discussion about climate change and other science-related issues pretty much all the time. And as you know, as well as anybody, we as scientists do struggle to communicate our work quite often. And we realize often through failures that relying on a clear description of the evidence based on careful observation or experiments or calculations doesn't always get through to many audiences. And after a while, we catch on that just like trying to speak in a, communicate in a country where one doesn't speak the host language, a shouting louder doesn't seem to work. So <laughs> there are many other tricks we have to learn. So we began to invite some social scientists studying science communication to some of our academy meetings. And in an effort to at least begin the discussions about why we we're having such a difficult time. And we've learned much about the reasons that we were not successful and how we could do a better job of understanding and reaching our audiences. Uh, for example, research findings in the social sciences of communication have helped us enorm enormously in helping some of our specific efforts here at the Academy. We now know more about how people form their beliefs and attitudes and we understand somewhat more fully why we sometimes get caught in the middle of political disputes or economic arguments or moral judgments. And we've learned a lot more about the influence of the media, social networks, and other social and economic factors. So those interactions with a few social scientists whetted our appetites for a more systematic kind of engagement and then we hosted the first Sackler Colloquium on the science of science, science communication in May of 2012, I think it was. And we certainly saw then that we have a lot more to learn with each other, therefore this sequel. Now, at this gathering, just like the one before it, we are pushing people in sometimes uncomfortable ways. We are leaning on our social science friends to bridge the gap 
from their rather tidy studies to the complex world in which communication actually takes place. We are leaning on practitioner friends to listen to people who have scientific evidence about how communication works, to augment their own professional judgment, for example. And we are leaning on subject matter specialists, and I work as one here, to listen to both social scientists and practitioners while making certain that they get the facts right and understand their importance. Thus, we are stretching all of you intentionally and with the hope that this uh, stretching and tension might lead to some more innovative ideas and new and fruitful collaborations. Today, I'm eager to experience how all of us approach and seek to understand the complexities associated with successful science communication. So I'm really looking forward to getting on with it today and tomorrow, and I understand that yesterday went very well. Now I have the privilege of introducing our keynote speaker. Kathleen Hall Jamison is going to speak in just a moment, and I think those of you who do not know her are in for a treat. In fact, those of you who do know her are also in for a treat. <laughs> she's, she's a nationally recognized expert on debates, media, and political rhetoric. She directs the Annenberg Public Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania, where she has been a force behind two essential nonpartisan uh, <clears throat> websites. They're called factcheck.org and flackcheck.org, each calling out the deception and confusion that are generated by parties and partisans. You will find out in the first few seconds of her presentation that, he's, that she is not only an accomplished scholar of communication and rhetoric, but she also practices what she preaches. So, Dr. Jameson, please take over. Anthememe, a powerful concept in communication. Audiences invest content with meaning. I invite you to do that with that classic song by Meatloaf. Responding to the best of, of the available evidence is the, the, the theme that I'd like to offer you today, but I'd like to start by doing so uh, and making a distinction between the ways in which we transmit knowledge and the ways in which we induce belief. Those of you familiar with the Pascalian wager, hold that thought to the end of this presentation. I'd like to posit that there are two different kinds of communities in my model of how the world ought to work. The scientific community is part of one, the journalistic community is part of another. The scientific community is part of what I would call the expert or elite community responsible for knowledge generation. And into that box, I would not simply put the scientific community, but also such institutional entities as the Bureau of Labor Statistics. I would put the Congressional Budget Office into that category as well. Places that are custodians of the knowable. They use the best available methods. They internally critique their methods across time to try to pr pr improve them. And in the process, they also police what it is that they communicate. And so the community itself is responsible for making sure that it does the best that it can to communicate what is knowable with the best available evidence. Now, it doesn't often do this with complete certainty. And in the process, it communicates how certain its knowledge is with the best available evidence of certainty. You have the journalistic community, which doesn't really generate knowledge. What the journalistic community does is uncovers what's there, and it provides a transmitting and a transfer function. But it, too, is responsible for being transparent, for disclosing how it does what it does, and for policing itself. And when it makes mistakes, as the scholarly community will correct, the journalistic community is expected to correct. And it is expected in both of these processes to be clear to the public about what it is doing and how it is doing it. Now what this means is that the journalistic community will critique the scientific community, and occasionally the scientific community will say to the journalistic community, you've got something really wrong. They both, when they perform their function well, inform the policy-making community. And in the process, they are able to hold the policy-making community accountable for its actions in relationship to the knowable. This is a pure model. Obviously, it's got all sorts of fuzzy edges, but I want to presuppose it in this presentation. And I want to suggest that the expert community's policing process 
requires that the public understand how it knows what it knows. Take a quick look at this slide. This is the way in which we communicate as a scientific community to the public that we should be trusted. And when the expert community certifies that it knows something through this process, we should be confident that it does. But sometimes it gets it wrong. Here's an example in which it did, a highly consequential example in which peer review failed and the expert community communicated something that it should not have communicated that was highly consequential. But the journalistic community, not finding out what the overall scientific consensus was, was complicit as well. Because the scientific consensus was not behind the conclusion that vaccines and autism are being correlated in a systematic fashion. Journalists instead ran with the expert certification, but one journalist didn't. The journalistic community was policing the expert community, and it should, that is its job. And the expert community did what you expect. It retracted when it found that there were flaws in the evidentiary chain. Now, that doesn't mean that this was unproblematic. Journalistic community didn't behave as well as it should have. It should have spotted an underlying consensus, but it did something right. So did the scientific community. Nonetheless, people were hurt. But they weren't hurt as much as they would have been hurt had those two communities not ultimately done what they are supposed to do and maintain their standards of self-correction. The problem is when these communities self-correct, which is what they need to do to retain their integrity and to do their jobs, those who are suspicious of them will frame those corrections as evidence that they are either inept, duplicitous, or partisan, thereby using that evidence to undermine those two communities. As a result, the first obligation of these communities is to correct, but the second is to frame the correction and let, lead the public to an understanding of the correction as the communities acting at their very best. Now, if they have to correct all the time, you'd start to worry about whether they were functioning well, but they function well enough that they don't have to do that. Most of the time, they get most of, they do, most of what they do pretty much right. So here's how my model works. If they do their jobs, if the expert community and journalistic community are credible, they can hold leaders accountable for misconstruing the knowable, and they can hold each other accountable, and they retain their credibility. There are factors, however, that undermine this model. There are challenges to the custodians of the knowable. And we've heard them. You have, for example, heard a partisan in the political arena suggest that the Congressional Budget Office is a reactionary socialist institution. Now, you might say that that sounds like an oxymoron, but listen to the charge, a reactionary socialist institution, and you hear a primal attack. It's an attack that suggests partisan, that the Congressional Budget Office is not using the best available methods to act and to determine what we best can know with the available evidence and acting as custodian of the knowable, but is instead simply articulating what a partisan disposition would dictate that it should in defiance of the available evidence. You hear that as well when you hear politicians on both sides and their representatives attacking the fact-gathering function of journalism when it impinges on their ability to construct the reality that they are offering the electorate. And their charge is often that is partisan. You journalists are partisan. And the attack often suggests that journalists are only partisan when they're critiquing one side. Nonetheless, it's a serious charge that the custodians of the knowable aren't doing what they need to do to preserve the integrity of the process. There's a second challenge to this basic model, and it's been articulated throughout yesterday. It's the tendency of individuals who are partisan to see evidence through a partisan filter. Once we prime up our partisan identity, we're more likely to use it as a way of seeing what is knowable and to select and to use that evidence in a partial fashion, not a fashion that best represents the available evidence. And so this combination of attacks, the suggestion that we can't trust the custodians of the noble, they make too many mistakes, or we can't trust them, they're fundamentally partisan, or individually, we become partisan in some moments, and as a result, no matter what they do, see what they do in a partial way, means that fundamentally the model is put at some risk under these circumstances.
What I'm going to focus on today is answering the question, how do you respond to that in a fashion that is effective? And what I want to suggest is that in every communication that we offer, there are actually two personae that are functioning. The first is the sense of who is the communicator. And the second is the sense of the audience that is the intended recipient. And we heard something important throughout yesterday, which is that we have a sense of the scientist as a speaking individual, and we judge that individual's credibility as we judge the credibility of the message. I'm going to try to offer a series of recommendations that increase the likelihood that the voice that one hears as the voice of the scientific community is a respectful voice that speaks from a credible, non-partial, impartial rhetoric to an audience that is envisioned in the rhetoric as an intelligent, thoughtful audience worthy of engagement. Because as a primal assumption, I am going to argue that you cannot persuade someone you do not respect. And if we are going to engage in a polemic, we are outside the engagement process that is appropriate either for journalism or for the expert community that is the custodian of the knowable. And as a result, I'm going to suggest that whenever possible, we are going to try to find common ground with those with whom we disagree, because here is my second assumption about how communication works when it is effective. To the extent that you and I share a common premise or a common assumption, I can build communication. But if we don't, I can't. As a result, Aristotle said, Enthymeme is the soul of persuasion, by which he meant the audience has to invest a meeting, invest meaning in a communicative exchange for it to work with the audience. Meaning exists at the intersection of a text, a context, and a receiving audience. And as a result, we are going to try to find the premise that the audience will grant and grant that the audience is capable of a communicative exchange with us that is intelligent because, and here is my third point, the scientist as communicator is, and I wouldn't use the word teacher, although I understand the sense in which it was used yesterday, the scientist is sharing knowledge. And the knowledge is gained by the best available methods with specification of the reasonable certainty with which we can know. Now notice what the persona is that I am communicating if I say the scientist is sharing knowledge, trying to build from what the audience knows and understands in a respectful fashion, and in the process trying to communicate with integrity what it is that is knowable under the current circumstances with the available evidence. With those premises about how communication works most importantly, I want to suggest to you that there are circumstances in which it's possible to establish consensus. We followed the gas tax holiday debate in 2000, in the summer of 2008. In that case, John McCain and Hillary Clinton had the same position. John McCain and Hillary Clinton both favored the gas tax holiday. Barack Obama opposed it. Now your partisan filters don't work because you've got the Republican and one Democrat on the same side. Perfect case study to see what happens when there's scholarly consensus in the elite community. There is scholarly consensus about a gas tax holiday, and it is, first, that you're not going to get much of that money back as the person at the pump if you get any back, because the gas companies are likely to simply keep the money. Secondly, it's a relatively small amount of money. And third, if you take that money back out of the system, you shortchange the fund that funds the highways and infrastructure, which can have an effect on jobs and also on the highways themselves. In other words, gas tax holiday, in general, bad idea. Lay logic, however, suggests, give me a gas tax holiday, and I'm going to get that money back. So what happens when lay logic confronts elite consensus in the absence of clear partisan cues? Hillary one side, McCain the other, Barack Obama, the person who's standing against the gas tax holiday. Across time, over a six-week period, the elite consensus was successfully telegraphed by the economics community, as well as by the historians who had studied past gas tax holidays, and by the press. And we watched in our rolling cross-sectional survey as the public came to accept the elite consensus 
even when the public was not, as a result, going to change its position on candidates. Elite consensus can be telegraphed under some circumstances, but it takes time, it takes education, and it takes breaking past a partisan filter. We also need to establish expert credibility from past success. I love the document, Science, Evolution, and Creationism. Here's one of its better examples. What would evolution predict? We'd find a certain kind of fossil. Fossil needs to be there under this pattern of findings. Well, sure enough, they found it. There it is. Notice the tone of the document. It's respectful. It is offering evidence. It assumes the audience is smart enough to process the evidence. It is not a polemical tone. It is the kind of tone that increases the likelihood that one will entertain and accept the evidence. We also need to find ways to counter the partisan filter itself. We learned yesterday about the research that says that as we cue partisanship, our identification as a conservative, liberal, Republican, or Democrat, we tend to see evidence through that filter. How do we position the audience to not be there? How do we prime up our nonpartisan selves is the first question. And how do we position the scientist as a nonpartisan as well to get out of that space to increase the likelihood that the evidence is heard, to hear the impartial voice rather than the voice of the polemicist or of the persuader? I'm going to suggest that we counter the filter in part by inoculating against the claim that is problematic, by employing evocative narratives to get this to stick schematically, and by using clarifying metaphors. And I'm going to start with a piece that appeared on the web page of Fox News. I introduced this briefly yesterday in another context. Notice the framing of the headline, Arctic sea ice up 60% in 2013. What do we want to do? Lay in place alternative interpretation of existing evidence. Now read the sections that I put on the screen that Fox is offering. It's offering those, and it is as well offering something that is very important for my argument, because it's going to cite data and show pictures from the National Snow and Ice Data Center of Boulder, Colorado. Remember that I want to find common ground. I'm now going to inoculate, lay up the alternative argument, indicate what my rebuttal position is, and try to situate that deeply and respectfully enough that my audience will accept the possibility that, yes, there is a change last year, but the trend line is a trend line that is down, and as a result, there appears to be a problem over time. And I'm going to do that with data from the National Snow and Ice Data Center. So if you've granted the evidence in the problem, you have to grant me the evidence that I'm using to recontextualize the problem. And now notice that I'm showing you a graph from that data center, and it is showing my trend line is down. Now I'm going to visualize it, because I want to make sure that you experience the drops, the rises, but the drops, and the ultimate adjustment in a trend line down. I want you to internalize this process so that your sense of what is happening is now being visually reinforced. You see those recoveries? I could argue at every place that things are getting better, but wait, my trend line the is down. The natural rhythm of sea ice growing during winter and melting during summer shapes life Need in the more Arctic. Audio. But over recent decades, Arctic sea ice is shrinking. Yet, exactly how do we now I'm we going know. to explain how we know. We have satellites like NASA's Aqua to thank. Claire Parkinson is the NASA project scientist for the Aqua satellite mission. She studies changes in Arctic sea ice using sensors that detect passive microwaves from objects below. Sea ice emits quite a bit of microwave radiation, much more than liquid water does, and this contrast is really valuable to us. Arctic sea ice has a huge seasonal cycle in Every part of that cycle, it's going down. I'm now going to give you redundancy behind the underlying message. What do I want you to take away? The same data center whose evidence is in the news piece is showing you data across time, visually reinforced, reinforced by the scientist who is speaking respectfully 
to the audience about the process by which we know. And what do you now know? You know how we know. You can envision the satellite, and it is knowing. And the scientist is knowing, and the trend line is knowing, and that data center is knowing, and now what we should have is a concept that the trend is down. Now we need to put in place ways of making this stick in memory. Some of you were here yesterday in which I talked about a headline in the New York Times that misframed, I believe, the controversy about sea ice over the last couple of years. That same article, which used the word may instead of what I would have preferred, is likely, was an article that included a statement that said the change is dramatic enough that it can be seen from the moon. Put this in your head. The change is dramatic enough that you could see it from the moon. Now put the trend lines in place. Now put the scientists in place. Now put the satellite in place. And now we're going to look to the scientific literature and we're going to talk polar bears. This is the way scientists talk. They say reductions in sea ice extent and or duration have been associated with shifts toward more land-based denning, evidence of nutritional stress, reduced body condition, reproduction, survival, and body size for polar bears in parts of their range. In recent years in the southern, in southern Beaufort Sea, there have also been more numerous observations of unusual predation attempts and of drowned, emaciated, and cannibalized polar bears. There is science behind polar bear claims. Now let's look at this context that we have created. The satellite, the trend line, the sea ice, the various data points of knowing across time, the small recoveries but the trends down across time, and view a video. No audio, no announcer's voice, just a video. Now I'd like to engage in a thought experiment. Suppose I'd started this presentation by showing you the web page from Fox and showing you the polar bear. How would you have treated the polar bear? First, I've primed a partisan disposition, Fox. Liberals in the audience prepared to counter-argue immediately, Fox. Conservatives, prepared to be reverential, Fox. I've now primed up, in other words, the very disposition I'm trying to undercut. And if in that context, someone puts up this polar bear as the alternative piece of evidence, I am going to counter-argue. I'm going to say, where was the polar bear? Was that staged? Was that polar bear photoshopped? How much footage did you have to take to get the polar bear to do that? Was there a whole ice mass around the polar bear and he was just fine later? Did you push him into the water? <laughs> if, however, I set up my context, and I would want to make sure, by the way, that this is a video that does have integrity, and I have laid up the science about what is actually happening, the polar bear now means something that is fundamentally different. Now the polar bear can become a visual anchor for a problem. And notice what I haven't claimed. I haven't claimed massive numbers of polar bears are drowning. That polar bear is not drowning in that video. I have not claimed polar bears will go extinct. I have not claimed they will be extinct tomorrow. And I've avoided showing lots of little tiny baby polar bears following a mommy polar bear into an open sea looking as if they're all going to die because putting that up would cue in you the sense that I am probably manipulating you. Evidence exists in a context and science should provide that context and we should vigorously scrutinize the integrity of all of the evidence that is available and offered. 
But in this context, what I have tried to argue is there's an inoculative structure that can be effective in using granted evidence in order to show trend lines to set in place a premise that potentially opens a dialogue. We also, I think, need to find clarifying metaphors in order to capture concepts. This is a clarifying metaphor I like a lot, and so I'm going to read it with you. The article's editors likened climate, ch climate change to someone habitually driving a bit over the speed limit. Even if speeding itself is unlikely to directly cause an accident, it increases the likelihood that something else, a wet road or a distracting text message, will do so, and that the accident, when it occurs, will be more calamitous. This is a very sophisticated, you could call it an analogy, I prefer to think of it as a metaphor because I like the car in relationship to something as, as a, a means of getting people into another domain to ask what are we saying when we're saying that there is a problem. What does it explain? It explains that global warming is likely to increase the number and severity of extreme weather events but it doesn't necessarily cause all of those that we're seeing at any given moment. Now that's a complex argument. It's hard to communicate that to people. But get the right metaphor and it becomes easier. The car that's just speeding a little over the limit. The lockdown metaphor is the way I describe this as a process. We need to find a way to communicate that there is a consensus. We need to establish that those experts who are communicating the consensus have been right in the past. We need to underscore their credibility. They need to employ a voice that is a credible voice, an impartial voice, a trustworthy voice, and I'm not sure how you make that a warm voice, but I do know how you make the content, a content that communicates warmth, you need to communicate that they care about this as an issue and a problem, but they care as much about their method and its integrity and ensuring that what they are telling you is as accurate as it can be given the existing state of knowledge. And it needs to be a voice that communicates respect for its audience. Disdain is not an effective communication strategy. We need then to have a voice that counters the partisan filter that we tend to evoke on our own, we're subject to this too, our own partisan filters, and the perception that we might as scientists be partisan by moving both of us psychologically into nonpartisan space through the available rhetorical cues in order to inoculate carefully against competing claims by honoring what it is people are saying, by representing it accurately, by finding common sources of evidence from which we can build, by providing deep alternative constructions of reality that let people understand what we know and how we know, how we know it, that we lock down with compelling, credible, accurate narratives and conceptually coherent metaphors. If we do that, we increase the likelihood that we not only, with Hippocrates, communicate what is knowable, but that we increase the likelihood that from it we get belief. One of the most difficult things to do rhetorically is to argue to future fact. All we have as we make the leap to future fact is our past credibility and our understanding of the method by which we are laying up our suppositions of the future. And ultimately, Blaise Pascal understood something really important when he put forward the Pascalian wager. Pascal was trying to prove the existence of God, and he concluded that you couldn't do it to an atheist. An atheist wouldn't grant you enough to make it possible. And so Blaise Pascal left in his closet one of his thoughts in the form of the Pascalian wager. And it went like this. Let's imagine that you suppose there is no God, and you act that way during your entire life. What are the consequences if you're wrong? Let's suppose that you posit that there is a God, whether you believe it or not, you act your whole life if there is, and it turns out there is. What do you get right? Ultimately, what the Pascalian wager does is says, what are the consequences of our being wrong, or the consequences of being right about something, whether you believe it or not, how should you act? At some point when we're dealing with future fact, 
and we're arguing that something consequential and real could happen, we are asking people to move from the world of what we know to the world of what, what we need, the world in which we need to act. It's that threshold point that Baruch was talking about yesterday. And in our persuasive acts, if we use inoculation well, and narrative well, and metaphor well, I believe that like those listening to the Pascalian wager, we will lead the kinds of lives that science would recommend based on the best available knowledge backed by the best available reporting. Thank you. I want to take a moment to thank Dr. Kathleen Hall Jameson. She actually finished five minutes early, which I wasn't prepared for. So that means we have a few extra minutes for our Q&A. But before we start that, I want to introduce myself. My name is Kara Santa Maria. I'm going to be um, moderating, facilitating all of the proceedings today. You may know me from my work as the um, co-host and producer of a late night talk show called Take Part Live. You may know me from my work on the Young Turks or even my internet web show called Talk Nerdy to Me. Or maybe you don't know me at all, and that's okay, because today you'll get to know me again as the moderator and facilitator here at the Sackler, uh, Sackler Colloquium for the science, or on science of science communication. So I want to start now by opening up to a Q&A, both with you in the audience and also with everyone who is at home right now. If you have questions that you want to ask, you can send them to sacklerwebcast at nas.edu, or you can tweet your questions using the hashtag Sackler. If you guys are in the audience today, we've got two mic runners who are going to be coming around. So instead of lining up, just sit where you are, raise your hand. A mic runner will come to you, and we'll make sure that we focus both on the front and the back of the audience that nobody gets ignored. Um, do, though, keep your questions short and to the point. We'd like to be able to ask as many questions as possible. I know it's really early, but we are going to go ahead and open up to the Q&A now. And I would love it if you guys came ready to, to discuss. So who has questions for Dr. Kathleen Hall Jameson? Hey, Dr. Jameson, my name's Aaron Hurtis. I'm with the Union of Concerned Scientists. One of the reasons that people seem to reject science is it's based on their values, it's based on their opinions about policies that are proposed in response to that science. Um, so this is true on vaccines, on climate, et cetera. Uh, so a lot of what you talked about was ways that scientists could present scientific information in more effective ways, but I, I wonder if you think there are some opportunities for scientists to become more conversant in values, policy, and some of the other reasons we see people rejecting the, the established scientific facts on a host of issues. And, and if so, how? Because scientists are often uncomfortable talking about values and talking about policy. Let me turn the question back to you. Tell me what you think a value is that's controversial. Um, sure. So in the context of climate change, um, I'm thinking a lot of Dan Kahan's research, uh, who I think has spoken here before. So people feel like people who want to reject policies associated with climate change, uh, they don't like the idea of the government taking away something that they like, their big car, their big house, the electricity they use, those sort of things. Uh, people who are more favorable toward what climate scientists are saying are generally more comfortable with government regulation, um, especially if it's to benefit the community over individual values. So it's this competition over values and how we think society should work and how government should work and our role in society with regards to each other that tends to affect how people are thinking about whether or not climate change is real or whether or not it's disruptive. Okay. You're in a different world in my model than, than you think you are. You think you're in my science world, you're in my policy world. So in my model, you are down in the bottom of that slide in which the policy world is debating the alternatives for, for action and whether or not this should be one form of government action or some other form of action. So let me switch to a different line of argument from the one that I have offered and a different voice. If you look at the New York Times op-ed that was written by EPA administrators under the, the Republican presidents of recent memory that was put together maybe middle of August, what you will see is people in the policy community making arguments from the policy community perspective using scientific evidence. 
And the argument in that op-ed, and it's a brilliant piece of rhetoric by Republican administrators who worked for Republican presidents, goes like this. First, this is who we are and this is who we worked for. We worked for these presidents, whom you know, basically what they're saying to the audience, and you voted for those presidents. And here is what we did. Clean air, clean water. Here, here is what we implemented that worked. So here are the policies that we put forward that worked. And as a result, we don't have rivers burning anymore. Okay? Now you notice there's a parallel between this mode of proceeding and what I recommended in the scientific community, but you're speaking in a policy voice now about alternatives. And these individuals then argue that what President Obama is recommending in terms of environmental regulation is consistent with some of what they have done in the past, and as a result, will cope with what they define as a serious problem. Now, notice the voice in which they are speaking. They're speaking as representatives who were appointed and in their previous lives you know, served in elected office in some cases, and who are Republicans. That breaks the partisan filter. What they're suggesting is that government action in the past of some sort was very productive. Now we've granted the premise that some government action can be productive. Very few people want to repeal the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts. Now they're reminding us of what it was like before we had that legislation and what we have now. And they're arguing what we, that is they, did worked. Implicit in that is a premise that you are now more disposed to grant than you were otherwise, even if you don't like government intervention. And that is that government intervention under some circumstances can be beneficial. Then the question is, what should it be? And now we are in a policy debate. So the first move that I make in these circumstances is to ask, who are you speaking as, and what are the arguments you are making? In my world, the scientist doesn't come down into those debates, because doing so risks some of the scientist's credibility when the, the scientist is laying out what it is we know. And I'm separating as a result, and what granted is an idealized model, the what we know and how we know it from what are the policy options that we face. And there never is a single policy option. You always have two or three different ways of getting at something. In that debate, you're drawing on a different kind of expert community. It's an expert community, but it's also there. But notice in the process, I've instantiated a common ground value which says there are circumstances in which some government action is required. The question is what in order to do what, and is it this one of those instances? We went through this process, by the way, in, very effectively in repudiating the Vietnam syndrome. And I'm of the Vietnam generation. When Ronald Reagan spent a great deal of time rehabilitating the premise that there were circumstances in which a military buildup was justified and military action might, must, might be justified. He went through a process of rehabilitating that in part by reminding us of the experience of the United States in World War II. One of his greatest speeches, the speech at Normandy, and the valorization of the boys of Plan de Hoke, the men who took the cliffs. What is he doing? He's going back to something we can grant in common. We didn't want to lose World War II. Military activity can be justified under circumstances. We need a strong defense in some circumstances. He's reframing to get past Vietnam. That's the move that I would make in those kinds of circumstances, but I would make it in the policy community, not in the scientific community. All right, we have a tweet who came, uh, that came in here, and I think this you know, is an interesting tweet because it has probably an ostensibly obvious answer, but I think there's some nuance here. Uh, this uh, Twitter user asks, is science credibility compromised by funding sources, such as Coke or BP, that have bottom line agendas? Disclosing the source of funding is part of transparency. And to the extent that our major reputable journals did not do that and published research that as a result would have been interpreted differently because the source would have been interpreted differently, when that happened, the scientific community in general took something of a hit because it wasn't honoring what should have been one of its standards. And so the, the question is, how do you accomplish what you need to accomplish without having a source of funding that is going to compromise your credibility? It's a difficult question. 
Uh, when we put together the Preventing and Treating Adolescent Mental Disorders volume, which we distributed to over 100,000 physicians at no cost, thanks to a foundation's funding, we did so and did it on that model because we didn't want any drug company money anywhere near the writing in that volume. The assumption was that the only way we were going to have the credibility to talk about whether drugs work and if so when and when they should be used was to be able to say that that funding wasn't there. I think it's very important as a result, one, to disclose source of funding behind all research and to let that weigh in the credibility of those who are offering the recommendations, and two, to ensure that our vetting processes in, journal, in journals is rigorous in disclosing those kinds of conflicts of interest. I think it's highly problematic. That said, I know that many people need to do research and they find no way to get funding other than to work with those who might have a self-interest in it. They have a very, very strong obligation when they do so to ensure that, that the, everything is being disclosed, data are not being suppressed, null findings are, are you know, being disclosed, et cetera, and all harms and risks are being disclosed as well. And academics should not be signing any non-disclosure agreements when they do those sorts of things. All right, a new audience question. Yeah, I, I have a question. My name is Josh Halper, and I'm at Howard University. I have a question about ethics, and specifically about the ethics of people in journalism schools who are training for public relations positions. Mm -hmm. Now, very often we've seen now that there are press releases from universities that claim that the moon is made of green cheese uh, because some professor there believes the moon is made of green cheese. So the question is, how do we train public relations off? And I, I choose that as a very neutral uh, thing, but there are in climate change and tobacco. There have always been these things. How do we train students in journalism schools who go into public relations positions uh, about the ethics of how they check and make sure they're not uh, publicizing the next Andrew Wakefield? Yeah. Well, first, I don't. Um, but the... The process of selecting the best from among the available means of persuasion involves the judgment about whether you've exhausted the available means of persuasion or not. We now live in a culture in which selective use of evidence is all but endemic in politics. And so I, I wouldn't necessarily limit it as a framing to science. It, it's a, it's a, a communication problem, period. One of the reasons that journalism is supposed to make sure that it is interviewed broadly and determined whether there is a consensus or not, is that if journalism falsely assumes there's a consensus when there isn't, you can have problems, and when it assumes there, you know, the, the reverse is equally problematic. Let me segue off to that just for a minute because I think it's an important point. The, because journalists are supposed to be assuring that the available evidence is exhaustively pursued in what they write and what they do and you have an entire profession which is set up to try to minimize the likelihood that some of that evidence is, is available, the investigative skills of the journalists need to be honed extremely carefully. And the, the need to go past uh, all of those things that are alluring, that is, the press release that you write from, is a very important journalistic reminder. When journalism accepts a consensus, however, that doesn't exist, we get the Iraq War. So when journalism, does, when journalism doesn't stand back and ask what is the available evidence and let's see it and let's get it disclosed, you run the risk that journalism becomes, journalism becomes an accomplice in such things as getting into Iraq. On the PR front, I'm not as worried about those who are trained to advance a case as those who are trained in sophistic mechanisms of advancing a case. And to the extent that we train people to do that, we're training them unethically, I don't think we ought to be doing it, and I don't think they ought to practice it. To the extent that someone knows that they're suppressing evidence as part of making a case, they're being unethical. Um, and if they're making a living doing it, they ought to be ashamed of themselves. Um, there's, we, we have that problem with everything that we do. You can misuse anything. It doesn't mean that students should not be trained in the process of persuasion or in the art of selecting the best of the, the available means of persuasion because that is also the way you make the best case for something. The question is how you use the art, not whether you should be trained in the art or not. All right, we've got another audience question here in the back. Uh, Julia Moore with the Pew Charitable Trust. I want to make sure that I'm understanding what you're saying about the scientist in the policy realm. Mm 
Are you saying that uh, if, based on credible evidence, the scientist says you should have children vaccinated, or based on credible evidence, you should be dealing as a society with um, uh, um, the use of uh, uh, fossil fuels, is that an area that the scientist, in your view, should not be engaged? No. The, 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 I think the scientist's obligation is to lay out what we know about the consequences of doing something, what we know about the mechanisms that produce those consequences. And so the case for vaccination is made based on the available evidence of its merits and an understanding of the science that produces the response that is elicited by the, the vaccination. It is the public policy arena, however, that needs to ask the question, should we mandate the vaccine? Should the vaccine be, del be delivered in school or not? Should parents be able to opt out of the vaccine under these kinds of circumstances? Do we pay for the vaccine to ensure that poor children are able to get the vaccine? And it's the scientist's job to say, is the vaccine safe or not? So I would try to draw the line. This is, the, this is one of those fuzzy areas. I would try to draw the line so that the, the scientist is making the, the recommendation based on the best available evidence and the policymaker is focused on the implementation process and looking at the available choices um, with, you know, in, in the context of, of receiving audience. All right, I'm going to go ahead and open up a big can of worms with this last tweet, considering that you have about two minutes to answer. Mm -hmm. um, this came in that says, at what point do we simply start ignoring the minority that will not agree or accept? The, you, a certain percent of the population is not going to be persuaded of anything. Uh, the question in a, in a democratic system is, at what point do you have sufficient consent in order to act? And the problem there is a political problem as much as anything. Um, in an environment in which we have made just about everything partisan, it becomes extraordinarily difficult to act when we need to act. Um, but we have mechanisms in a democratic system to decide when, when you have you know, sufficient um, you know, numbers of votes in order to create action. By the way, in answer to the framing question that was raised yesterday, sometimes you're framing your message for one single individual because sometimes the president has the capacity to act unilaterally. Because we've elected the president, he's exercising that prerogative. If the courts think it's unconstitutional, they can act in relationship to it. But many decisions have as their prime audience the person who has power, and it's not a need, there's no need to get a 51% public opinion representation on it. You simply need to persuade that one person. And in some cases, we are framing as if we need to persuade the entire public. That's useful if the person's subject to re-election. But if the person is not, the primary audience sometimes for framing is simply the person who has the authority, the governor, the president, the person who can act. All right, it looks like we're out of time. Thank you so much, Dr. Kathleen Hall-Jameson. Yeah.